welcome, welcome to another episode of the Pixelated Sausage Show. Hi, 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 hi. How are y'all doing? I hope the answer to that question is, well, I'm doing well, Mark. I'm, of course, your host, Mark Ruzhnez. That's why you said Mark earlier when I asked you the question and responded with my name, which is Mark, M-A-R-C, not short for Marcus. But I am Mark Ruzhnez, as I've already said, now twice. And, <laughs> yeah, remember when I said I was going to do plugs and shit at the top of the show? And then I think I did it two times in a row and 100% forgot last week. If you want to find me, I'm pretty much everywhere at PX Sausage and the YouTube, the site, the Discord, Patreon, patreon.com slash PXS, best way to support me and my nonsense if you'd like to support me and my nonsense. But links and so much more, pxsausage.com. That'll get you the good old link tree. Anywho, that is enough of that. I'll do that again at the end of the show. However, we are here to talk about some games and some books. What? Oh my God, I know. But I've got a few books, video game related books, including, well, not including, well, Yes, technically including, but they're just two of them, and I'm going to tell you exactly what they are, so it's not including, and then there are going to be additional ones. Enough of that. I've got the Game Console 2.0, a photographic history of, <laughs> not of, from Atari to Xbox, and Game Art, art from 40 video games and interviews with their creators. Those are the two books. And then after that, I have got the games that I've been playing, that I have played, I'm not still playing them because in some cases, I really didn't like them. And all, no, yeah, two of them I liked. Two of them, not so much. I'll let you try and figure out which is which by the names. We got Oceanhorn 2, Knights of the Lost Realm, Alice Sisters, Koa and the Five Pirates of Mara, and Adore. And that's Adore the video game, not Adore, the wonderful, lovely, very sweet, cute little song from Amy Shark. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. I think it may also be the name of a Prince song or some other crap, but the only the only adore I know is by Amy Shark. Who I believe is an Australian artist. I had a very, very big window of well, that that's actually the last time I was ever seriously into listening to music. New music that is. I was listening to a lot of Australian acts in general, and then bands that would go to Australia to perform an original song and then a cover on Triple J. Big fan of Triple J. Maybe it's not good anymore, but when I watched it, good. That's how I learned of Vance Joy. And then his song Riptide was everywhere, including in the trailer for Man Up. Good song. I have some really depressing memories tied to it, but... Still really, really like the song. Anywho, let's get on to what I've been reading with the books. First up, and I'm going to include very, very, very brief visual aids because I am able to do that. But I also know that the majority of Pixelated Sausage Show consumers, nom nomers, listeners are in fact listeners and not watchers. There are people who do watch the show on the YouTubes. Thank you for that. If you don't, why not? Give it a shot. And if you don't like watching videos on YouTube, one, just know I keep my shit ad free. I don't know if YouTube adds their own crap or anything, but I don't think they do. Outside of cases where there are instances of copyrighted music or whatever, and then the owner says, I want to monetize this, even though clearly you're not going to make any money off of my shit. But I don't put ads on my thing because I don't want to. That's why I don't do it. And I don't do sponsorships or anything, any stuff like that. I just I want to keep everything nice and free of all that nonsense, allowing people to support me if they want to themselves, as opposed to going through other avenues. But yeah, if, if you're a listener give the YouTube a shot and even if you don't like it just like the video <laughs> and then go on your merry way my wayward son but first up we've got the game console 2.0 oh 
the photographic history from Atari to Xbox. It is from Evan Amos? Amos? Tori Amos. What, what, is that how she spelled her name? Amos. Amos. My brother. Who? I don't want to even talk about that. That's, you want to talk about some sad shit. He's a big Tori Amos fan, though. Now I'm trying to think. Is that how she spelled her name? A-M-O-S? But this is the second edition. And I want to focus mostly, <laughs> mostly on the changes from... 1.0, which wasn't called 1.0, it was just called the game console, colon, all that nonsense I already said enough times, because it was just the first edition, and now we have this revised edition, which predominantly adds Gen 9 hardware and peripherals, which is the Xbox Series, PlayStation 5, and I can't remember if that... I'm not trying to remember if they consider the Switch a Gen 9 console. I wouldn't. But they may. Not super important. What is important, though, is that this game... <laughs> this game. I'm so used to talking about games that I, I, I fucking call this a game. This book, I had the original release. And got signed a copy of this one with the changes, the additions... In addition to, as well, the new content, they did some new formatting and stuff like that to make it a bit more of a pleasant read, if you want to call it a read, from start to finish. But what I love about this book in particular, and why I picked up the original release, is because the photography in here is fantastic. Incredibly well composed shots very high quality clean photographs of hardware and peripherals and the best of it being when they do full teardowns of a console or a peripheral and by that i mean you've seen pixel art renditions of consoles to this effect i feel like the most common one I see is of the GameCube because it's just an incredibly gorgeous console. I don't know if I've said this here and I'm pretty sure it's what I would say. The GameCube is the best looking console. The fucking the GameCube had some really great games. Maybe not an overall high quality selection of games. I can't speak to the number of third parties on there or how I, I think they overall were pretty well done or performed well enough but still missing plenty given it's a Nintendo platform but uh despite having some questionable button placement probably still the most comfortable controller for me just resting in the hands and an overall great controller beautiful console some amazing games, Metroid Prime, both the Zeldas, Mario Kart Double Dash is the only Mario Kart I've ever liked, and Super Smash Bros. Melee is still overall the favorite in terms of as a fighting game or whatever, right? But what I'm getting at is that the, the full teardowns of consoles are where they have them layered top to bottom, and they're just every little component of them is shown and you can see them and it's very very cool so here is the atari lynx and i'll move the mic out of the way so you can see it better and you get that with the vast majority of consoles and peripherals in here you don't get it with everything and that's one of the downfalls i'd say with the revisions with the additions of Gen 9, I'm pretty sure every single piece of hardware that was added from Gen 9 did not get the full teardown photography treatment, which is unfortunate. I'm not sure why that is the case, 
But this is just a very, very good book if you like that type of photography and you really want these high quality images of all of this video game history, specifically hardware history. And I, I say that because while there is some accompanying text and a bit of information provided for all this stuff, it is very, very minimal. It is, a, it is very much so a photograph first, text second type of book. But it's, it's very, very cool. And you'll, you'll find so many things in here that you've probably never heard of or never really seen or in 100% of a lot of the cases you've never used. You may have heard of them, but you've never actually had your hands on one or seen one potentially. And it's fun just getting to see all this stuff. I, I find all that kind of stuff really, really fascinating. Like there's a, I forget which console it was, if it was a info something or other, but one of the consoles that's included in the original version, of course, because the majority of stuff is in the original release. The console is just basically the shell and then this really, really small, what do you call them? The, it's not a circuit breaker, but the, the little chipset where every, the, the, the piece of hardware, the piece of tech where all of the bits and pieces are that make the system run, it's very, very tiny. And then you just have this incredibly hollow shell where nothing is in it. So it's just, <laughs> it's like they were planning to make a slim down the line and so, say, yeah, let's just, you know, we want to double dip and sell this. So let's make this thing gigantic for no fucking good reason initially. But it's, it's, a, it's a good book. I really, really like the book. Then the second book, which is Game Art, Art from 40 Video Games and Interviews with Their Creators, is a pretty good book. My problem with Game Art is that it's not so much a problem. It's just something that I think you should know going in if you're interested, is that it is unlike the game console. It is very much so a text first book, art second. And I say that because there are plenty of instances where you'll have a two page spread that is just text from an interview, bits and pieces from an interview and then the author's notes on, on the topic and everything. And that's great. There's a lot of fantastic information in here. But if you are someone who is looking for an art book specifically, if you really want a lot of great art and for the focus to be on the art itself, the, the images, I wouldn't recommend it. But if you would like to learn about a lot of games because there are a lot of games in here too that you may not know of creators you don't know of and you may discover someone you uh, want to seek out more from so that's cool I, I think the game console is something that i like to just have and look around at but I, I think the game art book is something that would make a solid coffee table book not so much a reference book or anything of that nature but one of the things I was thinking when I, because the, the thing that bugs me about it too is that it's very lacking uh, creativity in, in its layout. It's just a lot of large bubbles for text on top of art, like this, for instance. And that's it throughout, which isn't bad, but. As I was reading it, I got my juices flowing and thinking about really overcomplicated ways to design the book in that you have all these games and various artistic styles. And what if you made a book where when covering each of these various games and these aesthetics, you did the best you could in the book format to really emphasize that style in that section. So the first section is about this game that has a pop-up book aesthetic and I was thinking to myself oh, wouldn't it be cool if that whole section that 10 or 12 because they spent about 12 or so pages on each game and creator wouldn't it be cool if that section was the art specifically was handled like a pop-up book would that be really complicated would it be super expensive yes but it would be cool but I just in a book 
about game art or uh, any book about art, I would like to see a little bit more put into the layout and design of the interior itself. But it's a solid book. It's a solid book. It's just not my favorite when it comes to art books. And two, while reading this, I realized I like the information, but for art books, I much prefer getting an art book that is focused on a singular title that I really, really love and know I love, and then I get so much art from it. But this is a, this is a nice coffee table thing, and a thing to just throw on there and people can look at it, whatnot. Those are the two books I got. So if you're if you're interested, you're on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever, and quite often on sale. So give them a, a look see if you fancy either of those. But now let's get on to what I've been playing, starting with Ocean Horn 2 Knights of the Lost Realm. This is a game that originally came out on Apple Arcade back in, I believe, 2020. And it is very much so a Zelda-like. And I, I don't want to say a Breath of the Wild-like because it's not open in that sense in any stretch of the imagination. But I do think visual and design inspirations were taken from that game. So there's that. But it's an okay Zelda-like that feels very, very mobile-ish when you start playing it on a regular console because the controls are limited and limited in a way that it makes sense if you're playing it on Apple Arcade, for instance, using, I guess, can you just use the regular remote if you don't have a game controller? Is every game included there required to work with that? That seems nuts. That seems nuts if that's the case, but I can maybe see it. But you don't have a jump. Instead, you just jump whenever you hit the the edge of a cliff or whatever a platform which works way better than I would have expected and in some cases it's nicer than having a more convoluted control scheme for jumping like in the Souls games which are what is it you have to push in the right analog stick or some shit I can't remember how they work in the Souls games but it's it's fucking annoying it it, it feels in the Souls games like it's set up that way so you will inevitably end up dying at least a few times accidentally just by trying to jump over a small gap because the controls are so fucking stupid. But you have a very limited amount of controls. You have your basic attack, a wind-up attack that I don't think the game ever told me about. I just figured it out on my own. And then a uh, dodge roll, and then eventually when you get your shield, you can put up your shield and push it around. But the game itself was fine. The the real thing about it is that one, I'll say it looks pretty nice. It's it's not gonna win any awards for super duper fidelity or anything of that nature, but it has a really, really colorful palette and it's got a nice clean aesthetic. So it's it's very crisp and clean and colorful, and it looks nice. It's a pleasant game to look at, and it runs well. It feels relatively good to play. But the world that you're exploring isn't that interesting. The enemies you're fighting don't put up much of a fight. They're not hard to deal with. I... got stuck on a puzzle that annoyed the, me a little bit because there's weird finicky stuff with the UI and the button prompts and natures because there there is no in-game settings that allow you to see the control scheme. They just have it on screen all the time, what the buttons do, which is a little annoying to have that always there. But 
the game at one point tell, uh, tells you, it, it tells you that you can pick up certain objects and throw them. However, it never explains that you have to aim to throw them because you also have a little gun, I think it is, and you get ammunition from destroying objects in the environment. But you can also pick up certain objects and throw them, but you have to be aiming to throw them. If you hit the throw button, when you're not aiming, you'll just place it. Even though on screen, it's still saying, press this button to throw. It, it doesn't say, press this button to aim and then throw. It just says, press the throw. So for the longest time, I was confused as to how I could, or you know, if I could throw shit at all. And that led to me not being able to solve this puzzle where I had to throw a pot at the switch to activate it even though I shot it with my gun to try and activate it because I figured, okay, it's in a distance I can't reach. I, maybe if I shoot it, that'll work. Didn't work. In that section, I also got introduced to the companion system, which uh, ha has you getting someone who can fight for you, stand on platforms or, or buttons for you so that you can reach new areas, etc. And I thought, okay, well, clearly this dude is going to be able to get up there somehow or they're going to be able to do something that'll activate it. That didn't work. So I was very, very confused for a while until I looked it up. And when I looked it up and, and saw the video, the person who was playing had to experiment to figure it out at first too. But then I saw that, oh, if you aim, you can throw. Good to know. And there are a handful of instances that I've experienced so far in the game where Things are a bit confusing because of the way the game words stuff. And I don't know if that's just because when they worded them or how it works on Apple Arcade, how it worked on Apple Arcade was more straightforward or, or more even more limited because of it being an Apple Arcade game. But ignoring all that, it's a it's a decent okay game. But it's $30. And that puts it outside of the, sure, why not, range. And more in the, hmm, range. And I think, unless you really, really are itching for a pleasant, easy, emphasis on easy, Zelda-like, I'd say wait for a sale. But it's, it's okay. It's okay. The characters in the world, don't care about them. The world itself, not super interesting. Explore what you're finding. There's a, a card game too. And this is another frustrating thing about it and how it needs to explain shit better is that there is this card game that you have a board on you and you can go up to any character in the game and say, hey, you want to play this game with me? And they'll play with you. But the game doesn't teach you the rules. I don't know if there's a side mission at some point that'll teach me the rules, but you would assume that when you first challenge someone that that is when the game is going to say okay let's teach you how to play it doesn't it doesn't do that and there's no guide in the settings there's no information or something you can look up there so you just have to either figure it out via trial and error or potentially there'll be a mission at some point that specifically has you doing it i feel like the latter is the case probably hopefully but if not that's that's not good. And then I think... Was it in that one? Let me look at these other games. Or was it Ko and the Five Pirates of Mara? No, I believe it was in Ocean Runner 2. I, I, I fought the first boss. And that was a pushover too. So... The game doesn't offer a chance. It, it's... It's just... It's okay. It's okay it's okay but it's the kind of game that i think you'd only really want to play if you had nothing else to play and you really like these types of games but that is again of storm 2 nice of the lost realm next up is alice sisters this is a pixel looking i mean it's, it's a pixel art 2D side-scrolling platformer. 
that doesn't seem to know if it wants to be for one player or two players because you can play cooperatively where one person is controlling one sister and another one is controlling another sister or you can play by yourself and switch between the two on the fly and by switching you switch them right in the place of the other one so it's not like they are constantly in different places and you have to keep moving them forward together that you just switch in the position you are which really breaks a lot of puzzles because there are many instances where you will have to change into one of the sisters so that you can first open up the path for the other sisters so they can get through and when you're playing by yourself you don't have to bother with this because you just go through that initial path and instead of opening up the path for the other sister you can just transform back into the other sister if you need to for a puzzle later down the road you don't have to open up this path to allow them to get through because they just got through via your route because they're they're just you when you transform and that is how it seems like the game is way more made for cooperative play because it, those puzzles just don't work when you're playing solo they just they're pointless but then later on as I was playing more and more there would be instances where the game got really really tedious for single player play and if I was able to do one thing and had a friend controlling the other sister and they were doing something at the same time it might be a little bit more convenient and not as tedious there's an instance where it seems like uh, it would be better to play it cooperatively. It's just a game with a confused identity that doesn't feel great. I played it solo only. I did not enjoy it at all. It has limited checkpoints too. There are, there are plenty of instances where because there, there may be one or two checkpoint per level and sometimes their placement is odd and they're too close to one another and you end up wasting it because the, the checkpoints, once you go through them, they're initiated. You can't re-walk past them to initiate them if you've made any more progress. So you have to try and be strategic with when you activate a checkpoint in some cases, once you realize that the checkpointing system is not the best. Because if you die, then you have to... I had an instance where I had to keep redoing a good chunk of stuff because of a stupid area and a stupid death but not overly fond of it and the the abilities that the scissors have are one can shoot a red ball that can activate switches or take down enemies and i think she's the only one maybe because she's a little bit heavier can activate switches by jumping on top of them but then the other sister can transform into a small form transform change before uh, between small and big by jumping on to these mushrooms mushrooms uh, that are either big or small and clearly small one changes you into a small one big one changes you back into a big person but like i said when you're playing solo you can just because you really only have to transform into small versions to solve puzzles that's the main thing and then you would have to change big to jump higher again to do certain things if you're playing two player but in solo just keep them small and then turn back into them when you need to get somewhere small you don't need to bother with the mushrooms at, anymore after that initial one in each level that's how one of the ways in which it's broken but that's that's all there is to it and it's just it's, it's not super fun and the last thing i want to note is that the game like a lot of 2d platformers the enemies that there are that are in there which are not they're just fucking animals mind of their own business and i don't like having to take them down every now and again and some of them aren't there's one that's just a happy like a smiley face and then you shoot it it doesn't cry but i, I feel it's tears inside of me one of the things that's frustrating about the game that I came across when I got to the second area is that throughout the whole first area, you were 
taught and it was constantly reinforced that to kill an enemy, to kill a, a creature, an animal, you could shoot them or you can jump on top of them all Mario-like. But then you get to the second area and there's this ladybug looking thing, a giant ladybug. You jump on top of that, you're dead. You can shoot it and kill it, yes. But if you jump on top of that one, for some reason, you're the one who dies. The fact that the game immediately took what it's taught you up until that point and constantly reinforced and then threw out the window with that and it, it made it so that I'd be worried about any new enemy I came across because maybe I'd die and depending on where I was in the level when I first came across that enemy where the last checkpoint was I just found that really really frustrating but that's Alice Sisters do not recommend whether you're solo or able to play co-op. Next up is Koa and the Five Pirates of Mara. I really, really like this game with a caveat, with an exception to a certain issue or whatever. L let me talk about the good first. Very, very cute, colorful, adorable aesthetic. Love, love the look of it. Your character, Koa, is incredibly adorable. She's just the sweetest little thing. And Mechanically, it feels really, really good. It's all level-based. A three, it's a 3D platformer. And with each level, you have a handful of objectives. Time, so you have par times, gold, silver, bronze medal, essentially. And then three collectibles to find per level that you can then eventually use to purchase cosmetics and stuff for your character. In addition to shells that are scattered across each level, which you use to purchase stuff as well. That's your, your main currency. And then mechanically, you've got a, a jump. No double jump, but the jump feels pretty good. A run, which is also your roll. And th this is where the mechanics get a little bit annoying. So the way you roll is by hitting the run button immediately as you touch ground so at right at, at, you jump and then right as you're about to land or right when your toes essentially would have hit ground you hit that run button and you'll do a roll and then at the end of a roll before you finish hit the jump button again you'll do a long jump the long jump i don't mind what i do wish was a little different was that the run button and the roll button were not the same because it makes the flow of movement a little cumbersome in that I really found it frustrating to have to let go of the run. I, I just wanted to hold the run button all the time, but having to let go of it so that I could press it at the bottom of a jump so that I would do the roll, I found that took a little bit away from the overall feel. It wasn't horrible, but something that I wish I could change, especially since you have various buttons that aren't seemingly used for anything. And so I wish I could either create my own control scheme and map it out, but you can't because you can change the bindings, I'm pretty sure, but the roll button, the, the, there's not even a run button. It's just that the roll button is the run button. They don't even say that it's the run slash roll button. And they never, I don't even know if they ever told you that you can run it in the game. I just figured it out because I'm like, eh, you kind of move a little slow by default. Your, your default movement though is adorable because it's it's not just a walk, it's skipping. You just get to see this adorable little Koa skipping and it's great. But outside of that one little caveat for me that I find ever so slightly cumbersome, I thought it felt really, really good to control her and then therefore jump around in these areas. And I eventually got to the point where I could see myself going back to levels later to collect goods, but I really, really enjoyed doing my first run like a speedrunner and trying to get through it as fast as possible because going through these levels 
as fast as you can is really, really satisfying. And the levels themselves are probably, if you go that route and aren't trying to find the collectibles and just exploring their small areas, are probably beatable in one to three minutes on average. But it's, it's super satisfying. It feels really, really good. And the way the game is structured is that these pirates have come or whatever and they stole a bunch of shit from your main island and you have to get map pieces to unveil more of the map and this this sea filled with these various islands. And then you travel from island to island on your little boat in a very zoomed out, bare bones, boat controlling system where you can collect some seashells there. You can run into whales to get their seashells, which is weird and so on and so forth and visit other small islands for very, very quick, simple challenges that could be a 20 second level or stuff of that nature. But then when you get to these main islands, you're doing levels in a typically, I think, re level structure where you start one and then you move on to the next one, the next one, and then you hit a boss type area to complete that area, to, to complete that island and then get a map piece so that you can unveil more of the map and unlock more of the, the world. And I like all that. It's, it's fine. It's a, it's a decent enough structure. So I love the way that feels. I love speed of running through these levels. Great flow. Looks great. Super cute and adorable. What's the problem? The problem is the game is way too fucking talky. There's too much story and they constantly are berating you with this shit. And there'll be times where I'm on this island because you go back to your main island every time you get a new map piece to get this cartographer to unveil more of the map for you. And then you, you'll just be going and doing that and then another character will be like, hey, hey, will you come here? I, I, want, I want to tell you something. And then they'll tell you some bullshit and then they eventually open up the store. But there are so many instances too where characters will go off on various asides and tell you a handful of useless information and then be like, yeah, that wasn't really important. This is actually what I was trying to tell you or what I wanted to tell you about, which is also not that important because I just want to tell you that I put some shit on these planks of wood and I'm selling them. You want to buy them? I'm like, fucking no, I don't want to buy them, okay? And if I did, just fucking give me a one sentence pitch and then let me look at your inventory and move on. But the game just loves to talk and talk and talk and these characters aren't interesting. There are a lot of annoying, stupid little girls who, <laughs> I, nothing against little girls in general, but these, these little girls, and there are a bunch of animal ones. There's a cat girl, a squid looking girl, and then this boho. There are a lot of dash hoes, hyphen hoes, in this game characters with those names what, what's that all about <laughs> but outside of that one comment, and you could you just skip it and you should just skip it i was just surprised by how talky the game was and how as in most of it was it was just ew, why why are you so talky you're not you don't need to be and i, I was surprised by how it remained talky throughout my time with it. But ignoring that, feels really good, looks great. I had a, a pretty good time with it. So I would recommend that to people who enjoy 3D platformers. Then the last game is Adore. Woo! This is a game, I, I played it, and it's a case where I don't know what the fuck I was playing. The base mechanic of the game is you're able to capture these creatures, not Pokemon-like. You capture them by standing in this specific cone of captureness and then waiting for it to fill up and uh, hopefully avoiding them attacking you so that they don't cancel your capture timer. And then the way you end up using your captured creatures is by sending them out to attack other creatures in the world. And the way you do this is that you're able to have four creatures equipped at any given time, and they are all mapped to the face buttons. So you press the X button, 
Y button, B button, A button, and the associated creature will be sent out and attack enemies before retreating and so on and so forth. You can hold the face buttons to place them specifically in a location if you want to make them attack a certain creature. And then you can tap the X button to retreat any creature you've sent out, regardless of what face button you use, or press the left trigger button to retreat all of them if you sent out multiple ones. And you're able to send out however many uh, notches of stamina you have. So you only have two to begin with, and that allows you to send out two creatures at one time. And then once you retrieve them, your stamina will refill very rapidly and you can send out additional ones. They all have health tied to them and you have health tied to you. But what I quickly learned and what made the combat and the system very, very boring is that the way it ends up working is that you'll be going through this area and it's a grid based type of thing where you have these very small areas that are all connected by pathways, very traditional rogue-ish. But when you're going to these areas, you can't leave them until you clear them out of all the enemies in them. And what makes combat very unsatisfying is that, as I said, I, I quickly learned the way to do it is just to send out your creatures at a particular enemy, uh, some enemy creatures, let them do their handful of attacks, which is usually a three hit combo. And once they do that, they kind of pause for a second before retreating. But if you immediately hit the retreat button, the, the recall button, whether it's the, the X button or the left trigger, if you send out multiple, that'll immediately turn them into these green orbs and draw them back to you. If you do that immediately after they do their attack, the enemy won't be able to counterattack fast enough. So the creatures you send out will never take damage. Then you get them back. And then you send them out immediately because you can hold it again and place them really close up on the enemy so they, they do the cra uh, attacks very quickly, then do the retreat. And it just became this pattern of sending out those creatures, have them do their attacks, then hit the recall button immediately so that they don't take damage and you just do this over and over and over and over again. And it makes combat incredibly boring. And I thought when I reached the first boss-like creature, that maybe things would change up and I'd have to think a bit more strategically or do something where I use certain creatures together because you can attach elemental effects to creatures and then have a kind of synergy between them. Don't have to bother with any of that either. With the boss, they just had a, a bigger health bar and more a more varied attack pattern. But outside of that, the the stuff I was doing, sending out my creatures to attack, recalling them, worked wonders on the boss. And I took them down with ease very quickly. And that's all there is to the combat. And then the, the game, the way it's structured, is that you are going into these areas and going from area to area in search of these shard or whatever things that allow you to capture additional creatures as well as certain items that characters in your refuge will ask you for. Uh, and this may be something like meat so that they can cook you something, which is just there to initially teach you about the cooking system and, and stuff like that. But the way all of that works is a little confused because it, it doesn't tell you exactly how to set that up, but the way you do it is that you will go to the map screen and then you will hit the search button and then say, I want to find this particular item. And then you have to make sure you scroll to the, the search button that you selected with the item you're looking for and make sure that's the, the one you have when you set off on your little adventure. And once you complete an area, you'll get a portal that takes you back to your refuge and then you just rinse and repeat. And what also became evident is that this game is going to be incredibly grindy and repetitive and you going on these little expeditions, these very, very short expeditions where you have to go through 
this same thing over and over and over again so that you'll eventually find this resource or that resource or this item or that item and you'll just be doing this over and over and over and over and over again and it just wasn't fun it's unfortunate because i think conceptually there's some cool things here but it feels very much so like a first draft that needs a lot of fleshing out a lot of the game just feels very very superficial very surface level where they thought of these systems but didn't flesh them out much or didn't think of how to implement them well so i don't like adore i you'd say did not adore it but i also didn't abhor it so i can at least say that that said i would love to see an adore too because i don't think they can or i i i wouldn't expect them to update adore in a way that expands upon what's there but if they took this foundation and flesh it out add a lot more depth and thought things out more i think there could be something cool here but it is it's not in a door sadly uh that is it for what i've been playing once again i am marcus and as y'all can find me pretty much everywhere at px sausage the site the youtube the discord patreon and so much more can be found over at pxsausage.com. Speaking of the Patreon, that is patreon.com slash pxs. That is the best way to support me and my nonsense if you would like to support me and my nonsense. So please do that if you can. If you can't, that's also a-okay. Like I said, if you're an audio listener, which is the vast majority of you, check out the YouTube. Maybe you'll enjoy the YouTube for whatever reason. And even if you don't, just like it. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button too. You don't have to fucking pay attention. Just hit all, hit all the buttons except for the one, the thumbs down one. Don't hit that one. Don't hit that one. Just hit the thumbs up one. Hit the subscribe one. And then hit that bell. And then we're good. But fucking thumbs down. Avoid it. Avoid it. It's it's not even there. What, what thumbs down button, right? Who, who sees the thumbs down button? I don't see a thumbs down button. But enough of that. As always, I appreciate each and every one of you. I. That's the, that's the way I end streams. So I'm already confused. Anyway. I hope you enjoyed this here episode. And I hope you have. Is this. I need to remember. How I end this damn show. But. That is it. That is all. As always. I appreciate. No I don't appreciate. I mean I do appreciate you. But that's not what I say. That is it. That is all. As always. Thank you for watching or listening. I hope you enjoyed this here episode, and I hope you have both a wonderful rest of your day, a lovely rest of your week, and a fantastic weekend. And if he's still listening and made it this far, just want to give a shout out to the brand new Dr. Sonny. Congratulations. It's an incredible achievement. You should be incredibly, incredibly proud of yourself. You are the weirdest human being I've ever had the privilege of knowing. How you're a doctor in addition to your other stuff, which we don't need to talk about here on the podcast. It'll it'll never not blow my mind, but I think all of your your science stuff is incredible especially as someone who has experience with Alzheimer's. And I know you've, I don't know if that, because we haven't talked about that in a while, what you're working on and this, that. So I don't, I don't know if that was the, the main focus or if that was just one of the things you've done or, or worked on or, or, or whatever. But as someone who's experienced a lot of, has a, has a fair amount of experience of that in their, their personal life. Anyone working on trying to better that and Hopefully, at some point, find a, a cure and, and, and stuff. I think you're awesome. So, congratulations, Dr. Sonny. Anyway, that is it. That is all. Again, appreciate everyone. Thank you for watching, listening. Hope you enjoy the show. Have a wonderful rest of your everything. So, 
that is going to do it. As, a, as always, no, you know, I say with the adios. Arrivederci. Bye.